Yeah. There will be, yeah. yeah. Most people, uh, well, welcome everyone to the Revolution 250 podcast. I'm Bob Allison. I chair the Revolution 250 Advisory Committee, and Rev 250 is a consortium of about 70 organizations in and around Massachusetts looking at ways to commemorate the 250th anniversaries of American independence. And every week we talk to someone who is somehow involved in recovering or interpreting that story. And our guest this week is Ashley White. And Ashley White is a, an associate professor of history at the University of Miami. So well, thank you for joining us, Ashley. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. And your first book is Encountering Revolution, Haiti and the Making of the Early Republic, which actually received the Gilbert Chouinard Prize from the Society of, uh, for French Historical Studies. And it is a great book looking at the impact of the Haitian Revolution on the early American Republic. So what can you tell us about the Haitian Revolution and its relationship to the American Revolution? <laughs> well, the Haitian Revolution is the second revolution in in the Americas, right? It's it's if you're if you're charting uh, revolutions, the age of revolutions, you typically begin with the U.S. Revolution, move to the French, Haitian, and then we think about independence movements in Latin America. But the Haitian Revolution results in the second independent nation. Um, in in the Americas, and it's important to the United States for so many reasons in the 1780s and 1790s. Um, in part because of the close ties that the United States had cultivated with the, what had been the French colony of Saint Domingue in the 1780s, in the aftermath of the U.S. Revolution, one of the one of the key concerns of many of the founders was how to resuscitate the economy. Um, in the aftermath of war and begin what is truly a, a national economy. And it was hopeful that Saint-Domingue, which is the most powerful, productive, and lucrative colony in the French Caribbean, would help to fill in this trade gap. And what you see over the 1790s are, are a good deal of ties cultivated uh, between those two uh, places. And then with the onset of the Haitian Revolution, which is related to, but in many ways distinct from the French Revolution, you see the people in the United States trying to navigate what this revolution in the Caribbean means for the United States. Um, and there are, there are several key differences between uh, the US Revolution and the Haitian Revolution, and perhaps the one that is the most um, striking is the fact that during the Haitian Revolution, you have the abolition of slavery and you have the recognition of citizenship for black men. And this happens in the 1790s, right? Um, and it becomes a real question for both white and black Americans as to what this new vision of a republic, one in which um, slaveholding is, is, is not a possibility, as well as uh, the rights of black men, what that means for actually the U.S. Republic, which with its constitution is sort of built on being a slaveholding republic. So the ramifications are, are huge and, and wide. Okay. So what, so what drew you to this story? <laughs> so I was drawn to the story because I, I didn't know anything about it. I had, um, I had I was in uh, grad school at the time and I was studying early U.S. history and I was interested in the age of revolutions. Um, but I, I didn't know the story of the Haitian Revolution. Mm -hmm. and, and that to me was surprising that it's something I didn't know as a, as a student of this of this era. And I have a, I think I have a leaning toward um, social and, and cultural history. Um, I, I, I went to the Winchester program before getting my PhD, so material culture is also something I'm, I'm deeply interested in. And um, I guess one of the things that piqued my interest in the Haitian Revolution, besides my ignorance and sort of wanting to know why I was, I was so um, unaware of such a, a, a watershed event, was the fact that I, I started coming across 
people from Saint-Domingue, people who were leaving the Haitian Revolution during the 1790s and early 1800s and coming to the United States. And these people are they're sort of the cornerstone of, of the book I wrote about, um, about the impact of the Haitian Revolution. And my interest was, was, was peaked because they go everywhere from New York to New Orleans in the 1790s and early 1800s. They're a multiracial population, they're white refugees, they're free people of African descent, and they're enslaved people who are brought. Um, and so for me, they seemed a really interesting vector through which to gauge how Americans, black and white, North and South, Federalist, Democratic, Republican, um, men and women, were trying to make sense of the Haitian Revolution as they unfolded and as it essentially arrived to their doorstep. They're coming face to face with the Haitian Revolution. Um, it's not a distant thing, it's, it's very yeah. present, right? Um, and so, from those kinds of encounters, um, I began to explore how people made sense of it, its ramifications, and the ways that Americans um, of different races, uh, different geographies, be began to try to make sense of the Haitian Revolution and the impact it had on the nation that was mm -hmm. built um, subsequently. Now, can you tell us about any of these individual characters, where they go and what they do? Sure, sure. So um, there are there are um, m many. Um, let's see, the greatest migrations come in different waves, right? So maybe mm -hmm. I'll, I'll talk about the broader oh, sure, sure. and then down to, to individuals. And some of those waves are tied to events with the Haitian Revolution. So. Um, the Haitian Revolution is usually sort of historians look back and we date it around 1791, the huge mm -hmm. slave rebellion on the Northern Plain. Um, and that begins to set off waves of refugees, but we see actually one of the most um, visible in 1793 when the main northern port in uh, Saint-Domingue goes up in flames, a, a big battle, which eventually uh, leads to one of the first emancipation proclamations in, in Saint-Domingue. But many people end up fleeing. <laughs> they sort of grab boats in the harbor and they end up going to places like Norfolk and Philadelphia not as many to Boston, um, mm -hmm. but also to Charleston, um, mm -hmm. at Baltimore, right? So you have these you have these peaks, and then another one comes in 1798 after the British are defeated. They invade Saint Domingue, hoping to make good on the uh, the discord wrought by the French Revolutionary mm -hmm. Wars and to take this colony. You see more refugees coming to similar cities. Um, again, mm -hmm. with the Declaration of Independence uh, in 1804, when Haiti becomes uh, an independent nation. And then there's a final migration in, in 1809, where um, refugees from Saint-Domingue who had gone to Cuba for exile are pushed out of Cuba with the sort of the, the beginning of, um, uh, well, the continued discord over Napoleon's actions in Europe, they're kicked out of Cuba and they end up in a huge wave coming into, into New Orleans, right? Um, and so the, the, the book tracks them, uh, their impacts mm -hmm thematically over this time um, and, and in these in these different cities. But there, there are a whole host of, um, of individuals and characters that, that crop up in the book and have different impacts. So for example, um, Mejor de Saint-Marie, who is um, famous in uh, French historical circles and French Caribbean historical circles because he um, is a lawyer, uh, a thinker, um, uh, a writer in Saint-Domingue who has some ties to the French Revolution, uh, but is also deeply pro-slavery. He ends up in Philadelphia and he starts a bookstore in Philadelphia and he has a collection of um, other refugees and some counter-revolutionaries around him in Philadelphia. And he writes what comes to be um, 
a multi-volume landmark description of Saint-Domingue, which is a kind of touchstone mm. source for lots of people uh, at the colony. Right. He also writes about his experiences in the United States and what he observes, and he has some very wry remarks about right. uh, of, of, of all stripes. Um, another famous refugee who arrives during this period is Pierre Toussaint, who is mm -hmm. a, a black refugee who leaves with um, his, uh, 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 at the time, master and mistress, and ends up in, in New York City. Mm -hmm. He eventually um, uh, becomes free. He sets himself up as a hairdresser in New York City, and he is a pillar of the of the Black community, the emerging free African American community mm -hmm. in New York City, um, and is also a, a devoted Catholic. So you yep. get you get a whole spectrum of folks who are who are now, turning Pierre, up. Yes, and and in, Pierre Toussaint is now on the path toward canonization. I understand exactly. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. so, um, so they go to different places and then mm -hmm. the United States also has different responses to this. I know your, your book is mainly about the social aspects of it, but then mm -hmm. the Adams and Jefferson administrations kind of take different approaches to it. They do, and and part of it is the way that um, the, the Haitian Revolution forces a, a kind of in each of its phases, right? Forces different responses from um, from from the U.S. government. So, um, if you want to talk about the distinction between Adams and Jefferson and Federalists and Democratic Republicans, it's it's pretty interesting and frankly, you see them some navigate. So, for example. Um, Jefferson, as early as 1793, is pointing to Saint Domingue, and he's he's he sort of makes this prediction that what's happening in Saint Domingue um, is is um, is a, a foreboding for the United States mm -hmm. that the United States will witness something similar. He calls them the bloody scenes of, of Saint Domingue, but he is also in that same uh, reflection, really really devoted to to averting them, trying to think of ways to make it um, um, not make the United States and its slaveholding republic not fall apart on, on terms similar. And of course, that's the view of, of a white slaveholder. African-Americans, uh, both free and enslaved, are, are, are looking to the Haitian Revolution throughout this period as a kind of beacon of hope of something that, that promises liberation and citizenship. Okay, so, but, so both when it comes to Adams in particular, you reach a kind of breaking point in uh, 1798, 1799. And that's in part because Toussaint Louverture, the leader of um, really the, the Haitian Revolution at this point, he's the governor general uh, of, the, of the colony. He's looking for ways to consolidate control to, um, he has already vanquished the Spanish and the British, but he's looking for ways to gain control over, over, the, over the whole island, essentially. And so as part of this, he reaches out to leaders in the Atlantic world, including uh, John Adams. And he writes to John Adams and says, essentially he's looking for a trade agreement whereby the United States would provide Saint-Domingue and its military with the things it needed in order to continue um, its campaign on the island. And, and, and this appears before Congress um, and and they they debate it, and it becomes this question as to whether it is, from the purview of these congressmen, better to um, trade with Saint Domingue in order to create a, col a, a closer relationship so that they can monitor what's happening there, and in some ways they hope quarantine themselves from um, what they some call the kind of contagion of liberty coming out of, of Saint-Domingue, or whether it's better to, re to repudiate Saint-Domingue altogether. And, and Congress stalls around this issue. And it's it's interesting because it's it doesn't quite fall as you might anticipate if you're a US historian thinking back from the purview of the Civil War along sectional lines, right? Of Southerners being actually mm -hmm. 
very much against trading with Toussaint literature and Northerners very much for it. Actually, party lines play uh, uh, more of more of a of a of a, of a power here than you you might expect. Mm -hmm. And but essentially, they don't come to a decision and they leave it in Adams's lap. And Adams decides that it's worth it actually to trade with Toussaint Louverture. He's feeling actually a good deal of pressure from merchants, including Boston merchants, who are mm -hmm. interested in continuing trade with Saint-Domingue because it had always been so lucrative, right? Um, mm -hmm. And they see Toussaint Louverture as a way to, to continue um, to, to pursue this, this lucrative trade. And so there is trade between the two. Yeah. Um, during the late 1790s and eventually um, uh, the U.S. is even abetting some of Toussaint Louverture's military endeavors in the southern mm. part of the island, intervening on his behalf uh, with a ship called the USS Green in order to, to abet his military victory. But the, with the revolution of 1800, that changes with Jefferson. Um, in that Jefferson is deeply unhappy with Adams's move with uh, Toussaint Louverture. He doesn't renew uh, the deal. And yet Jefferson faces a new, a new twist in the Haitian Revolution, which causes some of his pet ideas and projects um, to, to be more tenuous than he would like. In that in 1801-1802, Napoleon Bonaparte decides that mm -hmm. uh, abolition, in his view, had been a fool's errand in Saint-Domingue. He's mm -hmm. concerned about the black power, especially the power of Toussaint Louverture. He, he feels it as a rival and he's interested in reasserting uh, control and also um, reinstituting mm -hmm. slavery in all of the French Caribbean, Saint-Domingue, but also Guadeloupe and, and Martinique. And it's at that point uh, that he sends an army, a huge army, lots of vessels, tens of thousands of men to retake uh, Saint-Domingue. And it's at that point in 1802, uh, when Toussaint Louverture is arrested, it becomes clear, especially by what's happening in Guadalupe, Guadalupe and Martinique, that slavery is being reimposed in these colonies, that it becomes a war for independence in, in what becomes mm. Haiti. And Jefferson's worried, actually, about Napoleon in the French Caribbean because he feels that Napoleon could use then those French islands uh, to, to reactivate a French North American empire. So sort of <laughs> take back Louisiana oh. and make it mm -hmm. and make it much more French. And as you know, Jefferson, he wants westward expansion. Like he's had his right. eye on Louisiana for such mm -hmm. for such a long time. Mm -hmm. And so when General Leclerc, who is the one in head of the expedition to retake Saint-Domingue and, and reinstitute uh, slavery, he turns to Jefferson and he asks, like, can you can you help us with war material? Can you help us with provisions? And Jefferson initially is like, sure, sure. And then as it unfolds, he has second thoughts. So he just ignores uh, pleas from Leclerc for provisions. Um, and he allows merchants to continue to trade with um, the black army in, mm. in South Bang that's fighting for independence. Um, and it's because of that, or partly because of that, um, that, um, the Leclerc's expedition fails. It's also uh, the incredible bravery of uh, black soldiers fighting mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, Leclerc's troops. Yellow fever decimates. Right. But, but essentially, Napoleon gives up on mm -hmm. Saint Domingue, right? And because he gives up on Saint Domingue, he also decides to cut loose Louisiana. And that gives Jefferson right. the opportunity to, to actually acquire uh, the Louisiana territory. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and it's Hamilton who points it out at the time. He says, you know, mm -hmm. and of course, in a very Hamiltonian way, he, he suggests in a newspaper editorial that Jefferson has the black revolutionaries of Haiti to thank for the Louisiana mm -hmm. territory, which is, you know, a, a, a delicious observation for that is <laughs> that that is
He he didn't say it in song though. He just wrote no. it. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> maybe that's maybe that's to come. We can only maybe be, maybe this. That's right, that's, <laughs> Uh, and now you're working on a new book. Actually, it's soon to come out in about a year, a new book on um, revolutionary things, getting back to material culture. And just mm -hmm. one piece of this before you start talking about it, I just read your article on cockades and their significance. And this is, many of our listeners probably know what these are, but uh, many do not. So can we talk a little bit about the significance of wearing a cockade in your hat? <laughs> sure, I'd be happy to. So the cockade is a is a little Rosetta ribbon. So I I had a slide to show it. I should have sent one to, to Jonathan, but it's like about usually about this big, right? Um, and uh, they could be handmade. They could be. Uh, they eventually begin to be sort of produced and sold by. Mm -hmm. Right, and surprising folks during uh, the age of revolutions, but they've come like these um, these little badges. Um, mm -hmm. They're often described as what, uh, what people would wear in order to signal their political affiliation. Um, and these were popular before the age of revolutions. Like you'd see them and say in political contests in, in, in Britain, um, a, a candidate might adopt a particular uh, color and, and his supporters would, would wear them. But in the age of revolutions, they really take off, especially with the French Revolution. And if we think of the French tricolor, it's, mm -hmm. it's that cockade which becomes really prevalent. And if you look at any of the visual culture of this period, you'll see the cockade um, mm -hmm. as being emblematic of, of, of the French Revolution. But Cockades appear in so many places um, during the 1790s and early 1800s. Um, and typically this the story of political affiliation is, is, the, is the most prominent one that um, if, for example, you were wearing a tricolor cockade in the US in, in 1794, that meant you were for the French Revolution, right? If you were wearing a black one, that meant that you were against it. Um, but but what I found is actually cockades were were much more dynamic than simple badges, and they weren't necessarily um, repositories of, of fixed political messages. And in part, they they couldn't really be because of what France was at any given time, or what the French Revolution was at any given time, or the Haitian Revolution um, was was always changing and evolving, and hence mm -hmm. those objects, those, those things that people were, were wearing on their bodies were inspiring these debates. Um, and they were inspiring action because the other, a strong association with cockades were in the military. Um, there was a, in the 18th century, when one accepted a commission, there was a, a slang for it of mounting the cockade. You would, you would appropriate the cockade um, and, and that was in part um, symbolic, but it was also practical because in the 18th century, while there is this notion that soldiers should be clothed in, in uh, uniforms that all were all the same, that actually was really very, very difficult to achieve. And yeah. so on the battlefield uh, and, and in camp, people wore cockades so that they could be identified. Oh, nice, that's an awesome slide. Mm. Um, and you can, and I love it actually that the one is attached to the Liberty cap, the, that red right. cap, also really emblematic of the of the French Revolution. So, um, so that militaristic association of the cockade mm -hmm. slips into civilian life as it becomes this politicized emblem, and so what you see is the way that cockades inspire political debate, but also violence, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that becomes particularly important when it's not just white men wearing cockades, when women take up cockades, or especially when men of African descent, of women of African descent, pick up cockades, and they claim um, everything associated with that cockade. Mm -hmm. One, sort of a, a, a political point of view, which is evolving, right? So that the tricolor cockade could mean the French Revolution, but it could mean the Haitian Revolution too, mm -hmm. right? And, and people are trying to figure this out, especially in the purview mm -hmm. of the Atlantic. 
that they could take, um, that they could sort of not only sort of express their opinion, but also act on that opinion by being confrontational. And there are all these sort of mm -hmm. um, accounts of, of conflagrations in the streets as camps are, are meeting one another, sizing up their cockades and, and going to town. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's also important because military service in this period is often tied to citizenship, right? This mm -hmm. is true in, um, in the U.S. Revolution and the French Revolution. And for, for Haitian men, too, it's a vehicle by which they see themselves as active parts of the nation and worthy mm -hmm. of citizenship. So for women to be wearing it, right? If they're claiming all those association, are they are they pressing for citizenship too? So there's a way that cockades, um, because they're also cheap, they're accessible, lots of mm -hmm. people can make them. It just requires a bit of ribbon, which is within actually the means of many individuals in this period. Now they become these dynamic um, um, mm -hmm. sites of, of contest and and it's part of a larger argument about the book, but it, it, it helps us think about how objects, not just texts, not just events, become not mere illustrations of the age of revolutions, but vectors through which the revolution, it, the revolutions, in this case, the US, the French and the Haitian, mm -hmm. are, are, are being contested, are being debated, mm -hmm. are being just, are being, sort of acted uh, upon in all these sites throughout the throughout the Atlantic. We're talking with Ashley White, whose uh, forthcoming book is Revolutionary Things. So what are some of the other things that are circulating as part of this revolutionary world? Yeah, so there, there are many interesting things that are circulating uh, in this period that are associated with uh, the American, French, and Haitian revolutions. I'm interested in things that were associated with one of the revolutions and moved out. So not all things moved, to be sure. Mm -hmm. Some were really had a local or national significance. Right. Yeah, um, the Liberty so, Bell doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> Alas, no, right? But there are all other kinds of things that are circulating that are that become ways through which people appraise these revolutions, make sense of them, and then try to take advantage or act upon them, or in some cases, shut them down. So cockades are, mm -hmm. and accessories are one. I look at cockades and also medallions that are tied to it. But I'm interested as well in um, uniforms, military uniforms, and how they mm -hmm. circulate and, and what they mean as they get onto the backs of, um, of men throughout the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. I look at life-size wax figures. <laughs> this is the era wow. when Madame Tussaud gets her start. Yes, so Madame Tussaud right. is, a, is an exile from France who ends up in London and establishes her museum, but she actually, it turns out, is just sort of the most long lasting and perhaps um, mm. uh, visible uh, um, remnant of a, of a trend where bear which uh, wax mm. figures of revolutionaries and revolutionary scenes pop up in all different places of the Atlantic. So, for mm. example, in, in Boston and Philadelphia or New York, you could see um, Louis the 16th being beheaded by guillotine. Uh, so his wax wow. figure being beheaded. Um, <laughs> exactly. John and Elwiga Adams in the chat, I saw that um, mm. they go to see Patience Wright. He was an American, a wax modeler, goes to London, sets up her studio, and she has on one side uh, Republicans, on the other mm -hmm. aristocrats, right? So she's engaging in wow. these political debates too. You could see Charlotte Corday murder Marat uh, in the United mm -hmm. States. And and most strikingly uh, for me, and what, what really got me into so wax figures were um, that in, in uh, several cities in 1803, um, you could see a full-size wax figure of Toussaint Louverture, right? Um, so these wax figures are ways that people are, they're, they're fascinating in part because they right. are size. They're, they are, if you've been to Madame Tussauds mm -hmm. now, you know that there's this eerie uh, verisimilitude <laughs> with mm -hmm. yeah. wax figures. And, and so it's another way through which this particular media, which is say different from a print of the mm -hmm. same scene, uh, provokes different kinds of reactions and, and confrontations. And most often, at least the ones I, I focus on in the book, have to do with these really violent episodes from the French Revolution, mm -hmm. 
um, and to a lesser extent, the Haitian Revolution, and how people are processing revolutionary violence um, and, and what mm -hmm. it means. For, for the political context of the world. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, Jonathan was just telling me, by the way, that his mother made a lace work of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. That's probably too tame of a scene with too many characters to make a wax works, but you can see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he also raises, why do, why, why do so many women do wax works? You know, Madame Tussauds, patient, Patients' Right. Yeah, that's a great question. Part of the reason they do it is because it was seen as a kind of acceptable art for, for women. And so um, uh, women of a, of a certain uh, means and education. And usually they were doing modeling wax in uh, with flowers or uh, different sort of decorative arrangements for the home. But you also get um, wax silhouettes, like little, little mm -hmm. medallions. And then you have some of these women who become much more ambitious and her looking for ways, um, patients, right? For example, she's looking for, she's a widow and she's mm -hmm. trying to support her family. And she begins this endeavor with her sister, Rachel Wells to, to stage these figures. Um, and they become part of popular amusements that are in, you can see in taverns or sort of these mm -hmm. uh, traveling exhibitions. Um, but unlike sculpting and marble, for example, it's, it's something that is readily available. Wax is a lot cheaper. <laughs> um, yeah. And it, it's, it's seen within the realm of, of the possible. So um, it's, it's an interesting uh, genre, although there are male wax, wax modelers too, right? Who mm -hmm. start these uh, shows as well. So it's, it's not, completely exclusive, but it is interesting that for a public art, women are able to to um, assert themselves in some pretty prominent ways. Mm -hmm. How do the, it, where, where does the wax come from? I mean, where, where do they get it? <laughs> that is a good question. Yeah, that is a good question. The sourcing of wax. I mean, I think wax is actually much more pervasive in this era than we than we might imagine, right? Because, and yeah. I should point out, like the the sculptures themselves are what's modeled in wax is the head and the hands. Mm. So the rest of okay. it, if it's standing, it's an it's an armature, right? So, it, and I on see. that armature would be real clothing. They would use real hair, um, but it's just enough wax to make a head and hands, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so. Um, but wax has lots of uses in the 18th century um, in terms of a, a, a practical, I mean, think about sealing wax in this era, right? right. Um, so yeah. it, oh, yeah. it, exactly, or, or, or a kind of preservative too on top of foods, right? If you're looking to seal. Jelly for wax. sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. in some ways, like for us, it, it, it loses its, um, it, it seems a bit more exotic than maybe it it, mm. it was at the time, right? So um, it's yeah. it's actually a, a material with which uh, women would have a good mm -hmm. deal of exposure in a way that perhaps and right. manipulation in a way that marble they they would not. Right. I mean, yeah, not everyone can get a chunk of marble and carve it. <laughs> exactly. Wax is more malleable. Yeah. And exactly. you know, Jonathan points out that the Reverend George Whitfield, the Patience Wright, did his wax figure, and Phyllis Wheatley wrote a eulogy. In fact, her I think was her first published poem was a eulogy to George Whitfield. So it's it's okay. not just scenes of the macabre that are being portrayed. No, it's not. I mean, and these would be situated within, like, um, you know, like but that's kind of the interesting part too that they would be situated within all these uh, among all these other. Um, figures right which are some of which are of like the beauties of the day or some of them are figures like Whitfield or right. um or you know Adams looking presidential or, or mm -hmm. Washington um but but I think that's actually an interesting part of the conversation because then you have this kind of insertion of something like uh Louis the 16th being guillotined and and those who are putting on these shows and these shows the bigger shows could have hundreds of figures right mm -hmm. um they would offer, in the case of uh, Louis the Sixteenth, you could you could see it in a separate room if you wanted to. So, because right. it was provoking such a reaction to see the guillotine at work and to see it mm. real, um, um, mm. that they they kind of courted it off. Uh, but it's um, mm. no, it's it's 
it's an interesting venue of popular culture um, through which people are are appraising the now, right? They're thinking right. about what's going on. And so if we uh, if we think about um, um, if we think about revolutionaries as as not only political leaders but also kind of people that are new celebrities, like Charlotte Corday comes out of nowhere essentially, right? When and when she murders Marat, and people are kind of fascinated by her story, they want to see it. Why this woman stabbed mm. this man, and, and it was a, yeah. a famous. So there's that there's that curiosity about the revolutions as news and uh, these episodes. Um, and this kind of visceral experience of these episodes, mm. right? That you're experiencing yeah. in all these three dimensions, right. that you, you see a guillotine fall, even though you may not be at the Place de, de la Révolution. Right. So um, that that is as much a part of the revolutionary experience, the Atlantic revolutionary experience, mm. as, as reading a newspaper or picking up a political tract or right. getting gossip from a ship. Right. This is fascinating. We've been talking with Ashley White from the University of Miami History Department, and uh, we've talked about your first book, Encountering Revolution on Haiti and the Making of the Early American Republic, and you've suggested some additional readings for some great websites where there are maps and other things. And your forthcoming book, Revolutionary Things, deals with cockades and waxworks and lots of other things. Mm -hmm. So thanks for joining us, Ashley. This has been interesting, and I hope we can have you come back when to talk more about waxworks and other things. Um, <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to. Okay, thanks. And thank you so, so much. Want, it was a, real a real pleasure. This, this has, has been fun, and now I want to thank Jonathan Lane, our producer, and our many, many listeners. You know, we start thought we'd have a small circle in and around Boston. Actually, we have an audience in New York, Philadelphia, Medford, Neptune City, New Jersey, Australia, Sweden, Thailand, Guam, and Micanopy, Florida, and Northway, Alaska, and all kinds of points between 52 countries and growing. So thank you all for joining us, and thank you, Ashley, and now we will be piped out on the road to Boston.